what's up everybody welcome back to another highly bus reaction we're gonna be jumping into the next one on our netherlands history journey let's go learn a little thing or two this is michael de ruder one of the greatest admirals in history we have heard a little little bits and pieces about him throughout some of the other videos but let's dive deep let's go down that rabbit hole I appreciate you being here. If you're seeing this video, you're probably seeing it on the new channel. The old channel has a few copyright issues at the moment that we're working out. Make sure you subscribe here, though, so that you catch all of the, the drops that we're going to be doing because we can't drop anything on the other channel at the moment. So I appreciate you being here. appreciate you finding the channel. Let's jump into it. Let's check it out together. Let's roll. I'm saying, they know how to make it seem like a damn war just from a picture. Michiel de Ruyter was born into a family of modest means on March 24th, 1607, in the city of Vlissingen in the Netherlands. His father was a sailor and later a beer carrier, which left the family with little money. A beer carrier was a legitimate profession? A beer carrier? Is that just like a modern day beer delivery man or... His father was a sailor and later a beer carrier, which left the family with little money. However, their family found strength in their faith in the Protestant church, which guided de Ruyter throughout the rest of his life. For almost 60 years, de Ruyter's exploits at sea allowed him to be considered as one of the greatest admirals of all time. His brilliant naval victories in the service of the Dutch Republic made him a national hero and also a beloved figure to those who served underneath him. He is also remembered as a courageous and fearless leader constantly placing himself in danger from intense fire from listen just look at this scene for a second we're gonna take it back so we can hear him speak but just the scene itself imagine how terrifying it would be just to be broadside another ship and know for certain that there's gonna be cannonballs coming your way those things were not small like we're talking we're talking instant death like that would be one of the most nerve racking moments of all time i've been to afghanistan where they shoot mortars and stuff at you occasionally but you like you don't know it's coming here you'd be looking right down the barrel of those other cannons and going oh damn please let me survive this terrifying not a chance i would ever want to be a part of any kind of old school naval battle that's just some hardcore savage fighting savage close quarters naval combat. yes savage growing up in a port city he is first understood to have went on his first sea voyage at the age of 11 to brazil staying abroad for a year and learning as much as he could about life aboard a seafaring vessel at the age of 15 in 1622 he joined the armed forces and fought against the spanish during the relief of the dutch fortress of berhenop zome as a deck gunner during the battle he used artillery to bombard the Spanish forces besieging the city, causing many enemy casualties. Showing bravery at such a young age, he is also thought to have participated in an assault on horseback that eventually led to the relief of the city. After the siege, de Ruyter entered the maritime service as a petty officer for a period of time on a Dutch warship. He is believed to have been captured by Spanish pirates soon afterwards and taken to the border region between Spain and France. He managed to escape his captors with a few shipmates and remarkably walked back on foot the entire journey back to the Netherlands. Until 1631, he worked as a merchant in the Dublin office of the Vlissingen-based Lomsens brothers. From this time period comes a story when returning from a trip from Ireland, de Ruyter's ship was attacked by a group of notorious pirates called the Dunkirk hijackers that were operating off the coast of France. De Ruyter thwarted the pirate attack by smearing Irish butter on the deck of his vessel, causing the attacking boarding party to constantly slip and fall. This man seriously had the upper hand from buttering the decks. Like, who even thinks of something like that? Yo, bring me the butter, because when they get over here, I, don't want, I want them to be off balance. I want them to be sliding all over the deck. That's a genius, brilliant war move right there who would have, i wouldn't have thought of it what do we have a lot of that we can grease the deck with hey we got a shitload of butter down in the kitchen like who thinks of something like this amazing on the deck of his vessel causing the attacking boarding party to constantly slip and fall he had his men remove their shoes and wear special socks that better grip the surface that was coated with the butter the pirates became easy targets for the defenders and the attack was repulsed 
When his first wife died during childbirth at the end of 1631 and his newborn a few weeks later, de Ruyter decided to participate in a whaling fleet for three seasons. Proving himself a skilled sailor, he is made captain of his own else. ship in 1637, tasked with hunting the Dunkirk hijackers that he fought against years earlier. After successful operations against the pirates, he was commissioned by the Zealand Admiralty and given command of a warship with orders to support the Portuguese in the rebellion against Spain. He took part in the Battle of Cape St. Vincent on November 4, 1641 as third in command of the Dutch fleet, which fought against an attacking Spanish squadron. The aftermath of the battle was inconclusive, and de Ruyter believed the incompetence and behavior I'm of saying that's terrifying, no matter result. who you are. Disillusioned by his time in the Dutch Navy, he left military service and decided to become a merchant trader. De Ruyter purchased his own ship in six... Ah, uh, hey, you see, though? He left the service and then still kept right on boating, kept right on get. He moved. We do a lot of the similar things today. We get out of the military and we do the closest thing that we were doing in the military a lot of times. That's very cool to know that, hey, when he was done sailing, he wasn't done sailing. Like He just went out and did a different thing. Military service and decided to become a merchant trader. Very cool. De Ruyter purchased his Probably own more ship hardcore as a merchant trader. And became wealthy through trading from the Mediterranean to the West Indies. He routinely fought against the Barbary pirates and defeated them in numerous battles. His second wife died in 1650, and by 1652, he retired from the merchant service and married for the third time. He had intended to live out the remainder of his life in peace and quiet until he was convinced to come out of retirement to fight in the first Anglo-Dutch war that had started later in 1652. The first war between the English and the Dutch marked... He came back out of retirement to go back to war. That's how hard this dude was. That is extremely hard. The crisis and the long-standing rivalry between the two nations as leaders in world trade. De Ruyter finally had a chance to independently command a squadron of warships for the first time in his career at the Battle of Plymouth in August 1652. Although outnumbered close to two to one, he defeated the English fleet that boasted some of the best sailors and gunners in Europe. The victory was unexpected for the Dutch, and the largely unknown de Ruyter became a national hero in the Netherlands. Serving under Lieutenant Admiral Martin Tromp for the rest of the war, de Ruyter participated in five more naval battles against the English fleet. Tromp died at the final battle of the war in August 1653, and de Ruyter was soon offered command of the Dutch fleet. Fearful that accepting the position would anger officers senior to him, he declined. He instead chose to become the Vice Admiral of the Amsterdam Admiralty. The war ended with a treaty in May 1654 with terms favorable to the English that also included major Dutch concessions. Off and on for the next decade, de Ruyter spent time protecting Dutch trade in the Mediterranean against the Barbary pirates. He routinely freed Christian slaves from the defeated Barbary ships, further enhancing his reputation. In July 1656, the Dutch joined an alliance with the Danish in the northern wars against the Swedish Empire. De Ruyter I can't imagine having served during a time that was so savage on the seas. However, if I was serving, you damn right I want to be under somebody like him. I want to I want to be under somebody that's known, someone that people know that, hey, you don't mess with that dude. Don't try to attack his ships. Like, for real, he's just going to... That's not the one. Like, that's the person I want in charge. That's the, that's the person I want in captain of my ship. ...joined an alliance with the Danish in the northern wars against the Swedish Empire. <laughs> de Ruyter and the Dutch fleet sailed to relieve the besieged city of Gdansk on July 27th without any bloodshed. He was involved in a blockade against Portugal when he was called to battle against Sweden again in 1658. He led a naval relief force to liberate the Danish city of Nubor from Swedish occupation in November 1659. In the battle, de Ruyter's fleet deployed amphibious assault troops and small ships that successfully attacked the Swedish-held fort. A few years later, these kinds of troops would officially become the Dutch Marines, with de Ruyter being one of their founding fathers. In 1664, he fought the English off the coast of West Africa and recaptured Dutch forts that- This man's entire life was hardcore. Even after retirement, it was hardcore. ...had been taken earlier by the English. Crossing the Atlantic in 1665, de Ruyter was informed that the Second Anglo-Dutch War had begun. Sailing to Barbados, he attacked the English forts and destroyed shipping in the harbor. Turning north, he raided Newfoundland before crossing the Atlantic and arriving back in the Netherlands. Holy At the Battle of Lowestoft in June 1665, the current leader of the combined Dutch fleet, 
Jakob von Vossner Obdam was killed. De Ratter was asked again to take command of the Dutch fleet, and he finally accepted in August 1665. He led the Dutch to victory at the Four Days Battle the following June, in his first engagement of the war. De Ratter's tactics depended on disciplined maneuvers to achieve victory against his enemies, but often his subordinates or fellow squadron commanders failed to follow strict orders. This can be seen when he narrowly avoided a catastrophe at the St. James Day Battle in August 1666. The Dutch were beaten in the battle, but De Ruyter managed to save the Dutch fleet from greater destruction with a skilled withdrawal. The Dutch squadron commander, Cornelis Tromp, was dismissed after the battle due to negligence for separating his force from the main fleet to pursue an attack on the English. The Dutch fleet soon recovered and the following year saw the most famous and daring naval attack of De Ruyter's career in June 1667. The Dutch government wanted an overwhelming victory to end the war, so a daring raid on the English homeland was conceived and then led by De Ruyter. Sidelined from earlier in the year due to a serious illness, De Ruyter recovered in time to oversee the daring mission. On June 12, 1667, De Ruyter led a fleet of 60 ships into the mouth of the Thames River before going south. I don't think, like, when they say 60 ships, a lot of people can't fathom that. Like, a lot of people will say, oh yeah, 60 ships, that's not a lot. If you've ever seen, like, there's a lot of people out there that have never seen the ocean, that have never seen a ship in real life. They've only seen it on paper. Like, they're not small. 60 ships in any kind of a formation heading towards you would be terrifying. Unless you've got 600 ships. Like, woo. Mouth. He took the town of Sheerness on the Medway and then sailed inland toward the dockyard at Chatham. The English were completely taken off guard by the attack on its home waters. The English had blocked the navigable channel with a chain stretched from shore to shore, but Dutch engineers broke through the obstacle fairly quickly. Beyond the chain, the English navy stuck in port was defenseless against attack from the Dutch fleet. De Ruyter's men burned three of England's largest naval vessels, ten more ships of the line, and captured the pride of the English navy the 80-gun Royal Charles. De Ruyter towed the Royal Charles all the way back to the Netherlands as a prize. Throughout the raid, England lost 13 irreplaceable ships, while the Dutch lost zero. The raid on the Medway has been called the worst naval defeat in English history. To me, one of the to me back then, any ship loss would have been detrimental as hell because you gotta imagine how long it would take to build a new one. <laughs> We're talking like way before a lot of them super technology for speeding up processes and things like that. Hand built ships like at months still months, even if they had it down to that months yet. So every single ship that you sank from someone else's Navy would be uh, a huge, huge loss just from the amount of time that it would take them to replace it worst humiliations it has ever suffered in its home waters. The English sued for peace soon after the battle, and the war ended with a Dutch victory in July 1667. From 1667 to 1671, the Dutch government forbid de Ruyter from taking to the sea due to his recurring failing health. However, the Third Anglo-Dutch War started the next year in 1672, and de Ruyter led the fleet to defend the Netherlands against a planned English invasion. The English, who were in an alliance with the French, attempted to blockade the Netherlands to keep the Dutch in their home ports. De Ruyter first encountered and surprised the Allied fleet off the coast of Southeast England in June 1672. Both sides eventually withdrew after a costly battle. However, De Ruyter's show of strength against the larger combined fleet led the Allies to soon abandon their plan for a blockade against the Dutch. The following year, De Ruyter defeated the larger English-French fleet at Schoenefeld in June, and again at Tessel in August 1673. A large part of his success was that he was a master at fighting battles on his own terms. By he then, absolutely! He enemy fleets into smaller groups, with skilled maneuvers. De Ruyter's tactical control of his fleet frequently kept superior numbers of opposing forces disengaged from the conflict, drawing- How- how do you even- s Communication between ships didn't exist. Like, how are you signaling? How the hell does he do his other ships know exactly what he wants them to do? 
that's my kind of mind boggling. I never thought about that either. There's no radios. There's no anything like that. I never thought about how these ships would have signaled to one another. Signal mirrors? Frequently kept superior numbers of opposing forces disengaged from the conflict, drawing smaller groups into battles where the odds were in his favor. The English were driven from the war by their costly failures and with the Parliament refusing to fund the King's campaign any longer. They signed a peace treaty with the Netherlands in 1674, which left the French by themselves to fight against the Dutch. De Ruyter saved the Netherlands from a joint English-French invasion in which some consider his greatest accomplishment of his long career. His brilliant naval victories in the Second and Third brilliant is Wars an understatement. enabled the Netherlands to maintain a balance of power with England. De Ruyter sailed to the Caribbean to attack French possessions in mid-1674, but returned to Europe when his ships were stricken with disease. In January 1676, he commanded a joint Dutch-Spanish fleet in the defense of Naples at the Battle of Stromboli that ended indecisively against the French. Three months later, de Ruyter clashed again with the French at the Battle of Augusta. During the fighting, he was mortally wounded in the right leg by a cannonball. Both sides withdrew from the battle when hearing of de Ruyter's condition. Clinging to life for a week, he died on April 29, 1676. On March 18, 1677, De Ruyter was given a full state funeral and was- Look at this procession. The man, that's a ridiculous, just life story. Being through so many, the man survived everything. Disease on ship, cannonballs, like the whole nine yards, he lived through it all and then went back to do it again. When he could have just retired in his little cozy villa and said, I'm done, he went back when his country needed him. Like, that's some true, that's a true patriot right there. A damn fine patriot. I could definitely see why he would be hailed as a hero. Uh, that's intense. Super intense. On March 18, 1677, de Ruyter was given a full state funeral and was buried in Amsterdam. He is remembered not only as a brilliant admiral, but also as one of the greatest and most beloved national heroes in the history of the Netherlands. He might be one of the one of the most intense dudes that I've ever heard about. Battle-wise, I've heard of people doing some, some crazy things in battle, but you're talking about multiple wars, multiple battles, multiple, multiple encounters at sea with straight-up cannonballs and pirates and scurvy who the hell knows like seriously ridiculous guy right there that was an awesome uh uh super awesome little documentary if you guys enjoyed it go over and show history uncovered some love on their channel we just subbed up i hope you will too i'm gonna leave all of the stuff down inside of the description hit that like button if you liked it the dislike button if you disliked it check out one of my other videos up here subscribe right here if you want to see more content possibly your content until the next one have the combustible you guys be happy healthy safe i love you to the moon and back peace